Good morning. I'm Chris McCarthy. Welcome to this news briefing from the 253rd National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in San Francisco. We're joined today by Mr. Alex Farnsworth and Mr. Scott Smith from Brigham Young University. They will be talking to us about their work on how green laser light uh, can probe metals for hidden damage. Mr. Farnsworth? Thank you so much, Chris. So, at Brigham Young University, we've been working on developing new ways to look at the surface of a metallic sample to really understand what's happening. Um, so every time you kind of get on a plane or on a bridge, you kind of wonder, okay, in the back of your mind, like what if this fails? What if the bridge kind of falls down or the components fail or something catastrophic happens? You know, everyone in their rational mind just kind of does that intrinsically. However, thankfully, um, engineers um, go to great lengths to make sure that this doesn't happen. Um, they test the components they use to build these things um, and determine an average lifetime for a given component. Um, however, <clears throat> in determining those lifetimes, uh, they often have to break a lot of these components to do so to figure out just kind of an average um, of that. Ideally, we would like to be able to test a component without breaking it so that we can then continue using it. And that process is called non-destructive testing. And our team has been working on develop using a way of SHG, which is a nonlinear optic uh, way of using green laser light to create a response on the surface of a sample. And the response you're looking for is a doubling in energy from your excitation photons. And that gives you an idea of what is happening on the surface as the converted the convergence process is very dependent upon the surface conditions and so we're able to see with a huge discrimination the differences uh, on the surface to the minutest degree right um, so these current NDT methods um, that are commercially available right now often involve um, some form of imaging that rely heavily on technicians to either interpret the results um, or um, kind of look for microscopic fractures. Um, these microscopic fractures um, in the material come or rather form after a period of time of kind of an applied stress and so you might get just a, a small crack. Um, however, the small crack is, is the immediate precursor to failure. So things tend to just break apart um, when you start to see these. So current methods such as x-ray imaging um, or magnetic particle inspection only tell you um, if a component's likely to fail right before it fails. Um, with our technique, uh, second harmonic generation, um, we can see these changes um, far before this point. We can see them um, in the late elastic region and all the way through um, the plastic region, um, or at least preliminary tests um, that we've done seem to indicate this. Um, now, where do these microscopic fractures come from? Um, microscopic fractures um, or microfractures come from uh, or correlate to an increase in the dislocation density. Dislocations are irregularities within the material lattice of a, um, of a component. Um, and as the stress is applied, they tend to move towards the surface. And as we are dealing with a, a surface dependent technique, um, our, our technique seems to be fairly sensitive to changes in this dislocation density on the surface. Um, and so what we've been seeing is that as we pull on it, um, we can detect even small, um, or rather relatively reversible um, stresses that are applied to the material um, and that they have occurred. Because as anyone knows, even if you put energy into a system, then something is going to change in that system. 
And that's what also got us thinking about other ways of using SHG as a detection for changes at the molecular and atomic level. And so we branched into a form of corrosion that is seen in uh, ships. Uh, they use 5,000 grade aluminum, which is a magnesium alloy. And the magnesium, what will happen is it will migrate through the crystalline lattice and congregate on grain boundaries. Now this congregation will change the local type of aluminum and it becomes what is known as beta phase aluminum. And this beta phase aluminum has a huge impact on naval uh, integrity. Uh, it's been a known instant f instance for sailors to even put their foot through the hull of their own ship because of this undetectable beta phase corrosion. Uh, a method has already been developed by the Navy to reverse this corrosion. Now, the issue is, is we know it happens, we know how to fix it, but we lack a method that can reliably detect it without destroying or having to cut out a part of the sample already. And so we've been investigating and seeing some very, very exciting preliminary results using SHG to detect the sensitization of naval grade aluminums. And that is why we're so excited to be here today to answer any other questions that you might have. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? And please wait for the microphone and state your name and affiliation before asking your question. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. You made the point that this technique detects um, at the surface. What about um, damage within the structure internally? I mean, I know you said something right. about this can, this is often migrates to the surface. Can you just explain that a little bit more? Right. Okay. So um, when you cool a metal, like when you're you're forging it or, or forming it, um, there are irregularities in the inside the material, and we call these dislocations. They tend to migrate to the surface as you apply stress to it. So in our lab, we take samples and we pull on them um, in order to create weak points on these these dog bone shaped um, samples. Um, so you're right. There are weaknesses inside the material. Um, however, because we don't deal with a penetrative or penetrative technique, um, because SHG is so surface dependent, um, one of the limitations and kind of the struggles that we're dealing with now is that um, the conditions of the surface are, um, they affect the conversion process a lot, or drastically. Convert, um, the, the conditions being like surface finish. Right. Um, and because ideally, you can actually use SHG. It's been documented to detect things such as rust below a layer of paint. So it does penetrate um, to a small degree, but um, we, you can still sensibly think of this as a surface method. And that's where most, as Scott said, that's where most of the dislocations are going to converge to form those microfractures, which will lead to failure of your system. Right, so it's kind of an inferential technique. Ben Valsner from Chemistry World. Um, yeah. Do you have an idea at the moment as to what the range of alloys this will operate on is? So that's kind of the strength of this technique. If one of the weaknesses is it's super sensitive, um, the strength is that it applies to not just metals, but we're looking at going into composites. Um, we've done similar tests on um, plastics, um, kind of the polymers and the, the necking um, that they exhibit. So we've seen um, there's, there's a lot of potential for further applications. Um, one that I'm particularly excited to get into would be um, carbon fiber mm -hmm. um, or into industrial steels. Okay, uh, and quite a lot of, certainly in the aerospace industry, there's right. a lot of talk about coating super alloys with things like ceramics mm -hmm. because of their better heat uh, performances. Right. Is that also somewhere we, where we think this technique will work? It, we've been discussing in our lab, yes. We, the, the exciting part about this technique is that it has never been investigated before. So really, <laughs> the field is out there and it's uh, wherever we decide to go next. Uh, it just tends to have a lot of complexity because of a lot of, obviously we're talking about, you know, stresses will create a response, but so will atomic changes within the surface. So you have to be able to very definitively define uh, what 
is your parameters that you're looking for. Right. And that's, the, that's the, the difficulty in the right. experimental process. Right. Could you tell me about the, the actual physical detector itself? So it says you can use a commercial laser, but then what are you using to actually detect it? And d does that in itself come with constraints? Is it you know, the size right. of a yes. wardrobe? So. Um, it, because you need enough power mm -hmm. to uh, get enough of a response. So obviously you need a strong enough laser, but lasers are extremely compactable these days. I mean, we use a laser that is probably the size of your old Windows tower, and um, then it just goes down a, uh, I mean, it's bigger than we actually need it to be. Right, but as far as the detector goes, um, we're just kind of using a fairly standard uh, photomultiplier tube. Okay. Um, and so, you know, photons come in, and then we, mo um, we create a feedback loop, and then it just runs to an, a pretty standard oscilloscope. Um, so currently, that's what we're, what we're using. Um, so it's, the detector doesn't, um, doesn't limit what we're looking at um, very much. So there is potential that this could be miniaturized enough to put, say, inside, oh. inside a jet engine and uh, look at components in there? For sure. I mean... It, it's easy enough to say that you could turn this into a mobile device that a technician would wear mm -hmm. and then go along. Uh, I mean, so one of the th reasons that we like uh, the 5,000 grade naval aluminum is that it's usually not extruded, or, or meaning that it doesn't usually get pushed through into some interesting cross-sectional. It's usually just a flat sheet. So, I mean, you could just take a sensor and put it over this flat sheet, and as you go, you can detect and know exactly where um, either dislocations or mechanical stress has been happening or uh, corrosional concerns could be found. Right. And just one more from me, if that's all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, like with with non-destructive testing techniques, one of the big problems is validation, because it's very easy to take a piece of right. material, destroy it, and, and say, well, this was what was wrong with it. Yep. Um, and people are putting a lot of faith, if nothing else, <laughs> into knowing that your technique is genuinely going to tell them when something will fail. What, do you, what will be the steps that you need to take to validate this and prove to the military and to industry that this is a technique that works? I think currently um, we need to um, just get more... Um, more runs to show that, um, like, there's to, to build statistical significance. Um, currently, we're we're dealing with a lot of preliminary results that we're pretty excited about. Um, however, because um, the surface is there, are so many variables that go into the SHG signal that is formed or generated. Um, we we have trouble kind of working out the noise um, often, and so if anything, um, the technique is is too sensitive. Um, and so the trouble, I don't think, would necessarily be um, developing statistical st uh, significance um, because you can do these runs fairly rapidly. Um, however, it's, it's just ensuring that your conditions are such that, that, your, that one sample to the next is, is reproducible. Um, so, and that's, yeah. I, I believe that that's where the power is going to come in. Um, we can run our samples on something the size of your thumb, um, rather than needing an entire <laughs> fleet of ships to be able to test this method. Um, all we need are a couple hundred thumb-sized metallic samples. Mm -hmm. And using enough of those to, tr to truly trace the response curve and to correlate that to what is happening mathematically at the surface, then that is your validation. Okay, we have an online question. Uh, Christine Sa, American Chemical Society, is asking, are there any potential safety issue, issues for users that need to be addressed, such as exposure to UV light? Because uh, in the press release, we mentioned that mm -hmm. UV light bounces back when the technique is used. Do they need to wear right. special glasses or anything? Um, so, yeah, so, um, honestly, um, because it's a nonlinear process, the UV light that's generated even by this fairly, well, depends on the input power, but the fairly intense green laser um, is such that um, you don't get a lot of it. Um, in fact, you probably catch more of it from the sun just walking around day to day. Um, however, if shielding was an issue, um, the sensor, or like if you made this into a fiber optic brush, um, you could definitely shield 
um, the input and output um, area and be totally okay. I would say that you have more hazards coming off of your excitation beam um, mm -hmm. and just shooting yourself in the eye rather than uh, UV radiation. Right. Uh, Bela Buslig, American Chemical Society. Mm -hmm. We've ha had some reports of exploding turbo pumps in, in mass spectrometers uh, in the last couple of weeks. Okay. And uh, these are not anywhere near the size, the size of a jet engine, but, mm -hmm. uh, but they're running at comparable speeds or yeah. better. Uh, there is a perfect uh, way of looking at it. Have you been contacted? Or, or no, we, we I, I wasn't aware of that. We are well, more than willing uh, to talk. Uh, the, the company's mass specs are, are Psyx, but I think it's Hewlett Packard or slash Agilent that produces the turbo pump. And there's got to be thousands out there that need to be tested. Mm -hmm. Maybe a good, uh, good place be, to, uh, to be start. This would be application. And, right. and, and there's, there's how you gain validation. <laughs> <laughs> turbo pumps are very small. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we we haven't been contacted, but we're well, more than willing to Well, maybe you want to do the people. contacting. Right. <laughs> right. I, I can't think of a, a better way Mask of, of mm -hmm. looking at, at something that's practical, because there are several hundred mass spectroscopists out there that are dying to get their uh, mass spec back in online, but they've got to uh, get each one replaced. But whatever is replaced, they, they may be perfectly fine, but, uh, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, it may be a good, exa a good way of uh, testing. Now, the second question has to do uh, detecting heterogeneity in, in uh, uh, alloys and mm -hmm. so forth. I presume that this, this would be uh, uh, useful for that particular thing because most of the, the failures are due to uh, uh, not quite homogeneous materials. Mm -hmm. Right. Those um, small irregularities can form nucleation sites for all sorts of problems. Uh, so that, that is what is nice about SHG and nonlinear optics is that it relies upon the homogeneous surface that you're looking at, and so when it's not homogeneous, you you know it, you see it, uh, you see the light, and so it's another perfect example of ways that this method could be used to improve industry as a regulation method uh, for the types of alloys and the purity of alloys as well. Right. I think that parallel that question. Um, is we can we can definitely say that yeah we can apply this to alloys because that's exactly what we're doing in the beta phase, the beta phase mm -hmm. aluminum project that we're working on. Thank you. There's an online question from Abdul Majid. Um, they're asking, is there any probe in the material which is embedded for detection of hidden damage by the green laser? No, there is, there is no changing of the surface uh, or embedding of any sort of probe. Uh, we are looking at putting probes on the surface to quantify exactly how much strain we put on them, um, but we're not using a probing system in the, in the material. It's entirely off of the surface with laser light. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. The archived version of this session will be posted uh, uh, online at bit.ly slash ACSLive underscore San Francisco. And this was the last press conference from the 253rd National Meeting of the American Chemical Society. Uh, thank you for, jo uh, for joining us.